Charles the 14th and 3rd John or Karl John, Swedish and Norwegian, Karl Johan, the 26th of January 1763 to the 8th of March 1844, was king of Sweden as Charles the 14th John and king of Norway as Charles 3rd John from 1818 until his death and served as de facto regent and head of state from 1810 to 1818. He was also the sovereign prince of Pontecorvo in south central Italy from 1806 until 1810. He was born Jean Bernadotte in France and served a long career in the French army. He subsequently acquired the full name of Jean-Baptiste Jules Bernadotte French, Baptiste L. B. Nat. He was appointed as a Marshal of France by Napoleon, though the two had a turbulent relationship. Napoleon made him Prince of Pontecorvo on 5 June 1806, but he stopped using that title in 1810 when his service to France ended and he was elected the heir presumptive to the childless King Charles XIII of Sweden. His candidacy was advocated by Baron Karl Otto Morner, a Swedish courtier and obscure member of the Riksdag of the Estates. Upon his Swedish adoption, he assumed the name Karl. He did not use the name Bernadotte in Sweden, but founded the royal dynasty there of that name. <laughs> Early life and family Bernadotte was born in Pau, France, as the son of Jean-Henri Bernadotte Pau, Bayern, the 14th of October 1711 Pau, the 31st of March 1780, prosecutor at Pau, and his wife married at Boy, the 20th of February 1754 Jean de Saint-Jean Pau, the 1st of April 1728 Pau, the 8th of January 1809, niece of the lay abbot of Surix. The family name was originally Du Poe, or de Puy, but was changed to Bernadotte, a surname of an ancestress at the beginning of the 17th century. Soon after his birth, Baptiste was added to his name, to distinguish him from his elder brother Jean Evangeliste. Bernadotte himself added Jules to his first names as a tribute to the French Empire under Napoleon I. At the age of 14, he was apprenticed to a local attorney. However, the death of his father when Bernadotte was just 17 stopped the youth from following his father's career. <laughs> Early military career Bernadotte joined the army as a private in the Regiment Royal La Marine on 3 September 1780, and first served in the newly conquered territory of Corsica. Subsequently, the regiment stationed in Busançon, Grenoble, Vienne, Marseille and Ile de Ré. He reached to the rank of sergeant in August 1785 and was nicknamed Sergeant Bel Hamby, for his smart appearance. In early 1790 he was promoted to adjutant major, the highest rank for noncommissioned officers in the ancient regime. <laughs> Revolutionary Wars. Following the outbreak of the French Revolution, his eminent military qualities brought him speedy promotion. By 1794 he was promoted to brigadier, attached to the army of Sambra et Meuse. After Jordan's victory at Fleurus the 26th of June 1794, he then became a divisional general. At the Battle of Thiningen 1796, Bernadotte contributed, more than anyone else, to the successful retreat of the French army over the Rhine after its defeat by the Archduke Charles of Austria. At the beginning of 1797 he was ordered by the Directory to march with 20,000 men as reinforcements to Napoleon Bonaparte's army in Italy. His successful crossing of the Alps through the storm in midwinter was highly praised but coldly received by the Italian army. Upon receiving insult from Dominique Martin de Pai, the commander of Milan, Bernadotte was to arrest him for insubordination. However, de Pie was a close friend of Louis Alexander Berthier and this started a long-lasting feud between Bernadotte and Napoleon's chief of staff. He had his first interview with Napoleon in Mantua and was appointed the commander of the 4th Division. During the invasion of Friuli and Istria, Bernadotte distinguished himself greatly at the passage of the Tagliamento where he led the vanguard, and at the capture of the fortress of Gradisca the 19th of March 1797. 
After the 18th Fructidor, Napoleon ordered his generals to collect from their respective divisions addresses in favor of the coup d'état of that day, but Bernadotte sent an address to the Directory different from that which Napoleon wished for and without conveying it through Napoleon's hands. After the Treaty of Campo Formio, Napoleon gave Bernadotte a friendly visit at his headquarters at Udine, but immediately after deprived him of half his division of the Army of the Rhine, and commanded him to march the other half back to France. Paul Barris, one of five directors, was cautious that Napoleon would overturn the Republic, so he appointed Bernadotte commander-in-chief of the Italian army in order to offset Napoleon's power. Bernadotte was pleased with this appointment but Napoleon lobbied Talleyrand Perigord, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, to appoint him to the Embassy of Vienna instead. Bernadotte was very dissatisfied, he finally accepted the post in Vienna, but had to quit owing to the disturbances caused by his hoisting the tricolor over the embassy. After returning from Vienna, he resided in Paris. He married Desiree Clary in August 1798, the daughter of a Marseille merchant and Joseph Bonaparte's sister in law. In November of the same year, he was made commander of the Army of Observation on the Upper Rhine. Although solicited to do so by Barris and Joseph Bonaparte, he did not take part in the coup d'état of the 30th Prairial. From 2 July to 14 September he was Minister of War, in which capacity he displayed great ability. However, his popularity and contacts with radical Jacobins aroused antipathy towards him in the government. On the morning of 13 September he found his resignation announced in the Monitor before he was aware that he had tendered it. This was a trick, played upon him by Sillas and Roger Ducos, the directors allied to Napoleon. He declined to help Napoleon Bonaparte stage his coup d'état of November 1799 but nevertheless accepted employment from the consulate, and from April 1800 to 18 August 1801 commanded the army in the Vendée and successfully restored its tranquility. In 1802, Napoleon Bonaparte proposed that Bernadotte head to New France to serve as governor of Louisiana, which was to be transferred back to French control following the Third Treaty of San Ildefonso. In accepting the position, Bernadotte requested additional soldiers, settlers, and funding to support the colony, but Napoleon refused. In response Bernadotte, declined the posting and instead was named plenipotentiary ambassador to the United States. His posting was cancelled, however, after the sale of Louisiana. <laughs> Marshal of the French Empire. On the introduction of the First French Empire, Bernadotte became one of the 18 marshals of the empire, and from June 1804 to September 1805 served as governor of the recently occupied Hanover. In this capacity, as well as during his later command of the Army of Northern Germany, he created for himself a reputation for independence, moderation, and administrative ability. During the campaign of 1805, Bernadotte with an army corps from Hanover, co-operated in the great movement which resulted in the shutting off of Mack in the Battle of Ulm. In the Battle of Austerlitz the 2nd of December 1805, he was posted with his corps in the center between Soult and Lanz, and contributed to defeating the attempt of the right wing of the Allies to outflank the French army. As a reward for his services at Austerlitz, he became the first sovereign prince of Ponte Corvo, the 5th of June 1806, a district of Naples formerly subject to the Pope. However, during the campaign against Prussia in the same year, he was severely reproached by Napoleon for not participating with his army corps in the battles of Jena and Arstadt, the 14th of October 1806. Napoleon, on the night of October 13, thinking he had faced the whole Prussian army at Jena, sent orders to Bernadotte and D.A. Vaut to fall back from Nomberg and get across the Prussian line of retreat. In pursuance of these orders, Bernadotte, separately from D.A. Vaut, left Nomberg at dawn on the morning of 14 for Dornberg and marched towards Apolda, which he reached by 1600. Hampered by the very poor state of the roads, he could not engage in the Battle of Jena, though he effectively compelled the Prussians to retreat from both battlefields by posting his troops on the heights of Apolda. Afterwards, Bernadotte was accused of deliberately refusing to support D.A. Vaut, who had unexpectedly encountered the Prussian main army at Arstadt, out of jealousy, and Napoleon, if reminiscences from St. Helena may be believed, once intended to put Bernadotte before a court-martial. In fact, he did what he had been ordered to do, and more fundamental responsibility for his absence rests upon the ambiguous and indirect orders issued by Berthier and Napoleon's unawareness of the Prussian position. After the Battle of Jena, Bernadotte defeated the Prussians at Halle, the 17th of October 1806, but the headquarters did not much appreciate this victory. 
When visiting Halley after the battle, Napoleon enigmatically commented, Bernadotte stops at nothing. Someday the Gascon will get caught. Subsequently, Bernadotte pursued, conjointly with Soult and Marat, the Prussian general Blücher to Lübeck, and aided in forcing his capitulation at Radkau the 7th of November 1806. When the French forced their way to Lübeck, the city became the target of large-scale looting and rampage by the French soldiers. Bernadotte, struggling desperately to prevent his men from sacking, was given six horses from the Council of Lübeck as their appreciation. He also treated captured Swedish soldiers with courtesy and allowed them to return to their home country. The impressed Swedes went home with a tale of Bernadotte's fairness in maintaining order within the city. Thereafter, he marched to Poland and defeated the Russians at Morungen, the 25th of January 1807. Since the messenger had been captured by Russians, Bernadotte could not take part in the Battle of Ela, 7 to the 8th of February 1807. Napoleon rebuked him for his absence but it became acknowledged that it was not due to Bernadotte, but Berthier's carelessness in dispatching the orderly. After the Peace of Tilsit, in 1808, as governor of the Hanseatic towns, he was to direct the expedition against Sweden, via the Danish islands, but the plan came to naught because of the want of transports and the defection of the Spanish contingent. Being recalled to Germany to assist in the new war between France and Austria, he received the command of the Ninth Corps, which was mainly composed of Saxons. Further difficulties with Berthier, and inclusion in his corps of the ill-prepared Saxons combined with his illness to make him beg for release from service. Bernadotte wrote to Napoleon that I see my efforts perpetually paralyzed by a hidden force over which I cannot prevail. Napoleon disregarded these appeals and Bernadotte proceeded with the campaign, commanding mostly foreign troops with few French. At the Battle of Wagram, the 6th of July 1809, he commanded this corps, of which the division of Dupas formed part. Having resisted on the left wing for a long time an attack from a superior force, he ordered Dupas forward to his support. The latter replied that he had orders from the emperor to remain where he was. After the battle, Bernadotte complained to Napoleon for having, in violation of all military rules, ordered Dupas to act independently of his command, and for having thereby caused great loss of life to the Saxons, and tendered his resignation. Napoleon accepted after he had become aware of an order of the day issued by Bernadotte in which he gave the Saxons credit for their courage in terms inconsistent with the Emperor's official bulletin, with Bernadotte having returned to Paris, the Walcheren expedition July 1809 caused the French ministry in the absence of the Emperor to entrust him with the defence of Antwerp with the National Guard. In a proclamation issued to his troops at Antwerp he made a charge against Napoleon of having neglected to prepare the proper means of defence for the Belgian coast. He was deprived of his command of the National Guard, and ordered on his return to Paris to leave for Catalonia and take command of the army there. Refusing to comply with the order, he was summoned to Vienna, and after an interview with Napoleon at Schönbrunn accepted the general government of the Roman states. <laughs> <laughs> Offer of the Swedish throne In 1810 Bernadotte was about to enter his new post as governor of Rome when he was unexpectedly elected the heir presumptive to King Charles XIII of Sweden. The problem of Charles's successor had been acute almost from the time he had ascended the throne a year earlier, as it was apparent that the Swedish branch of the House of Holstein Gottorp would die with him. He was 61 years old and in poor health. He was also childless, Queen Charlotte had given birth to two children who had died in infancy, and there was no prospect of her bearing another child. The king had adopted a Danish prince, Charles August, as his son soon after his coronation, but he had died just a few months after his arrival. Bernadotte was elected partly because a large part of the Swedish army, in view of future complications with Russia, were in favour of electing a soldier, and partly because he was also personally popular, owing to the kindness he had shown to the Swedish prisoners in Lübeck. The matter was decided by one of the Swedish courtiers, Baron Karl Otto Morner, who, entirely on his own initiative, offered the succession to the Swedish crown to Bernadotte. Bernadotte communicated Morner's offer to Napoleon, who treated the whole affair as an absurdity. The emperor did not support Bernadotte but did not oppose him either and so Bernadotte informed Morner that he would not refuse the honour if he were elected. 
Although the Swedish government, amazed at Mourner's effrontery, at once placed him under arrest on his return to Sweden, the candidature of Bernadotte gradually gained favour and on 21 August 1810 he was elected by the Riksdag of the Estates in Örebro to be the new Crown Prince, and was subsequently made Generalissimus of the Swedish Armed Forces by the King. Before freeing Bernadotte from his allegiance to France, Napoleon asked him to agree never to take up arms against France. Bernadotte refused to make any such agreement, upon the ground that his obligations to Sweden would not allow it. Napoleon exclaimed, Go, and let our destinies be accomplished, and signed the Act of Emancipation unconditionally. <laughs> <laughs> Crown Prince and Regent On 2 November Bernadotte made his solemn entry into Stockholm, and on 5 November he received the homage of the Riksdag of the Estates, and he was adopted by King Charles XIII under the name of Charles John Carl Johan. At the same time, he converted from Roman Catholicism to the Lutheranism of the Swedish court. Swedish law required the monarch to be Lutheran. The new crown prince was very soon the most popular and most powerful man in Sweden and quickly impressed his adoptive father. Following his first meeting with his new heir, Charles XIII, who had initially opposed Bernadotte's candidacy, remarked to his aide-de-camp Count Charles de Chermain, My dear Chermain, I have gambled heavily, and I believe that after all I have won, he also made himself well liked by Queen Charlotte, who regarded him a gentleman in every sense of the word and established a net of contact within the Swedish aristocracy, befriending in particular the Bra family through his favourite Magnus Bra and Countess Aurora Wilhelmina Bra, whose cousin Mariana Koskel became his lover. The infirmity of the old king and the dissensions in the Privy Council of Sweden placed the government, and especially the control of foreign policy, entirely in his hands. The keynote of his whole policy was the acquisition of Norway as a compensation for the loss of Finland and Bernadotte proved anything but a puppet of France. Many Swedes expected him to reconquer Finland, which had been ceded to Russia, however, the Crown Prince was aware of its difficulty for reasons of the desperate situation of the state finance and the reluctance of the Finnish people to return to Sweden. Even if Finland was regained, he thought, it would put Sweden into a new cycle of conflicts with a powerful neighbour because there was no guarantee Russia would accept the loss as final. Therefore, he made up his mind to make a united Scandinavian peninsula by taking Norway from Denmark and uniting her to Sweden. He tried to divert public opinion from Finland to Norway, by arguing that to create a compact peninsula, with sea for its natural boundary, was to inaugurate an era of peace, and that waging war with Russia would lead to ruinous consequences. Soon after Charles John's arrival in Sweden, Napoleon compelled him to accede to the continental system and declare war against Great Britain, otherwise, Sweden would have to face the determination of France, Denmark and Russia. This demand would mean a hard blow to the national economy and the Swedish population. Sweden reluctantly declared war against Great Britain but it was treated by both countries as being merely nominal, although Swedish imports of British goods decreased from £4,871 million in 1810 to £523 million in the following year. In January 1812, French troops suddenly invaded Swedish Pomerania and the island of Rügen. The decisive reason was that Napoleon, before marching to Moscow, had to secure his rear and dared not trust a Swedish continental foothold behind him. To render it the more insulting, Napoleon scheduled it for the Crown Prince's birthday. The invasion was a clear violation of international law as well as an act of war so public opinion in Sweden was understandably outraged. Moreover, it antagonized the pro-French faction at the Swedish court. Thereafter, the Crown Prince declared the neutrality of Sweden and opened negotiations with Great Britain and Russia. In 1813, he allied Sweden with Napoleon's enemies, including Great Britain, Russia, and Prussia, in the Sixth Coalition, hoping to secure Norway. After the defeats at Lützen, the 2nd of May 1813, and Bautzen, the 21st of May 1813, it was the Swedish Crown Prince who put fresh fighting spirit into the Allies. And at the Conference of Trachtenberg, he drew up the general plan for the campaign, which began after the expiration of the Truce of Plaswitz. Charles John, as the commander in chief of the Northern Army, successfully defended the approaches to Berlin and was victorious in battle against Oudinot in August and against Ney in September at the battles of Grobieren and Denowitz. But after the Battle of Leipzig, he went his own way, determined at all hazards to cripple Denmark and to secure Norway, defeating the Danes in a relatively quick campaign. 
His efforts culminated in the favorable Treaty of Kiel, which transferred Norway to Swedish control, however, the Norwegians were unwilling to accept Swedish control. They declared independence, adopted a liberal constitution and elected Danish Crown Prince Christian Frederick to the throne. The ensuing war was swiftly won by Sweden under Charles John's generalship. The military operations in 1814 were to be Sweden's last war to this day. Charles John could have named his terms to Norway, but in a key concession accepted the Norwegian constitution and its own political autonomy. This paved the way for Norway to enter a personal union with Sweden later that year, during the period of the Allied invasion of France in the winter and spring of 1814, when it was unclear who would rule France after the war. The Russian Tsar Alexander I flirted with the idea of installing Charles John on the French throne in place of Napoleon. Ultimately the British and Austrians vetoed the idea, and the Allies agreed that if Napoleon were to be deposed, the only acceptable alternative was the restoration of the House of Bourbon. <laughs> King of Sweden and Norway Charles John had been regent and de facto head of state upon his arrival, and took an increasing role in government from 1812 onward, with Charles XIII reduced to a mute witness in government councils. Upon Charles's death on 5 February 1818, Charles John ascended as the Union King, reigning as Charles XIV John in Sweden and Charles III John in Norway. He was initially popular in both countries. The democratic process and forces steadily matured under the king's restrained executive power. The foreign policy applied by Charles John in the post-Napoleonic era was characterized by the maintenance of balance between the great powers and non-involvement into conflicts that took place outside of the Scandinavian peninsula. It made a sharp contrast with Sweden's previous hegemonic expansionism resulted in uninterrupted wars with neighbouring countries for centuries, and he successfully kept his kingdoms in a state of peace from 1814 until his death. He was especially concerned about the conflict between Great Britain and Russia. In 1834, when the relationship between both countries strained regarding the Near East crisis, he sent memorandum to British and Russian governments and proclaimed neutrality in advance. It is pointed out as the origin of Swedish neutrality. His domestic policy particularly focused on promotion of economy and investment in social overhead capital, and the long peace since 1814 led to an increased prosperity for the country. During his long reign of 26 years, the population of the kingdom was so increased that the inhabitants of Sweden alone became equal in number to those of Sweden and Finland before the latter province was torn from the former, the national debt was paid off, a civil and a penal code were proposed for promulgation, education was promoted, agriculture, commerce, and manufactures prospered, and the means of internal communication were increased. On the other hand, radical in his youth, his views had veered steadily rightward over the years, and by the time he ascended the throne he was an old ultra-conservative. His autocratic methods, particularly his censorship of the press, were very unpopular, especially after 1823. However, his dynasty never faced serious danger, as the Swedes and the Norwegians alike were proud of a monarch with a good European reputation. He also faced challenges in Norway. The Norwegian constitution gave the Norwegian parliament, the Storting, more power than any legislature in Europe. While Charles John had the power of absolute veto in Sweden, he only had a suspensive veto in Norway. He demanded that the Storting give him the power of absolute veto, but was forced to back down. Charles John's difficult relationship with Norway was also demonstrated by the Storting's unwillingness to grant funds for the construction of a royal palace in the Norwegian capital Oslo. The construction began in 1825, but the Storting halted the funding after the costly foundation was laid and demanded that the appointed architect, Hans Lintau, construct a simpler palace. This was seen by many as a protest against unnecessary spending and the king's authority. The place itself was not completed until 1849, long after the death of Charles John, and was inaugurated by Oscar I. The main street in Oslo, Slotsgaten, would later be named after Charles John as Karl Johans Gate. His popularity decreased for a time in the 1830s, culminating in the Rabulist riots after the Les Majestés conviction of the journalist Magnus Jacob Krusenstolp, and some calls for his abdication. Charles John survived the abdication controversy and he went on to have his Silver Jubilee, which was celebrated with great enthusiasm on 18 February 1843. He reigned as King of Sweden and Norway from 5 February 1818 until his death in 1844. 
Topic: <laughs> Death. On the 26th of January 1844, his 81st birthday, Charles John was found unconscious in his chambers having suffered a stroke. While he regained consciousness, he never fully recovered and died on the afternoon of 8 March. On his deathbed, he was heard to say, "'Nobody has had a career in life like mine. I could perhaps have been able to agree to become Napoleon's ally, but when he attacked the country that had placed its fate in my hands, he could find in me no other than an opponent. The events that shook Europe and that gave her back her freedom are known. It is also known which part one played in that. His remains were interred after a state funeral in Stockholm's Ritterholm Church. He was succeeded by his only son, Oscar I. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Titles, styles, honors, and arms. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Titles and styles. The 26th of January 1763, 1794, Monsieur Jean Baptiste Bernadotte. 1794, the 18th of May 1804, General Jean Baptiste Bernadotte. The 18th of May 1804 to the 26th of September 1810, Jean Baptiste Jules Bernadotte, Marshal of France. The 5th of June 1806 to the 26th of September 1810, Jean Baptiste Jules Bernadotte, Sovereign Prince of Pontecorvo. The 26th of September 1810 to the 5th of November 1810, His Royal Highness Prince Johann Baptist Julius Avenue Pontecorvo, Prince of Sweden. The 5th of November 1810 to the 4th of November 1814, His Royal Highness Charles John, Crown Prince of Sweden. The 4th of November 1814 to the 5th of February 1818, His Royal Highness the Crown Prince of Sweden and Norway. The 5th of February 1818 to the 8th of March 1844, His Majesty the King of Sweden and Norway. His full title upon his accession to the Swedish and Norwegian thrones was His Majesty Charles John, by the grace of God, King of Sweden, Norway, the Goths and the Wends. Topic: <laughs> Honors. The main street of Oslo, Karl Johans Gate, was named after him in 1852. The main base for the Royal Norwegian Navy, Karl Johansvern, was also named after him in 1854. The Karlsborg Fortress Swedish, Karlsborg's Fastning, located in present-day Karlsborg municipality in Vastra Gotaland County, was also named in honor of him. The Caserne Bernadotte, a French military building located in Pau, was also named after him in 1875. National decorations First French Empire, Knight Grand Eagle of the Legion of Honor 2 February 1805 Kingdom of Italy, Order of the Iron Crown, First Class Sweden Grand Master of the Order of Charles XIII Grand Master of the Order of the Polar Star Grand Master of the Order of the Seraphim Grand Master of the Order of the Sword Grand Master of the Order of Vesa Topic. Foreign decorations Kingdom of Bavaria, Knight of the Order of St. Hubert 1805 Denmark, Knight of the Order of the Elephant 10 October 1808 Kingdom of Portugal, Grand Cross of the Order of the Tower and Sword Kingdom of Prussia Knight of the Order of the Black Eagle 1805 Knight Grand Cross of the Order of the Red Eagle 1805 Grand Cross of the Iron Cross 1813 Russia Knight of the Order of St. Andrew 30 August 1812 Order of St. George, 1st Class 30 August 1813 Order of St. Alexander Nevsky 30 August 1812 Kingdom of Saxony, Knight Grand Cross of the Military Order of St. Henry 1809 Spain, Knight of the Order of the Golden Fleece 1822 <laughs> Arms and monogram <laughs> 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 
Fictional portrayals Louis Emile van der Berch and Ferdinand Langley's 1833 play Le Camaret de Lit, the Bedfellow", depicts Bernadotte as King of Sweden. An old grenadier claims that, as a young man, Bernadotte received a tattoo of a scandalous republican motto, either Mort Ox Roy's, Death to Kings, or Mort Ox Tyrants, Death to Tyrants, or Mort O Roy, Death to the King. The tattoo is finally revealed to read Vive la République, Long Live the Republic, and a Phrygian cap, a highly ironic image and text for the skin of a king. This play was so popular that the idea that King Charles XIV John had a tattoo reading, Death to Kings, is often repeated as fact, although there is no basis to it. However, it is true that Bernadotte wrote in 1797. Being a Republican both by principle and by conviction, I want to fight all Royalists to my death." The love triangle between Napoleon, Bernadotte, and Desiree Clary was the subject of the novel Desiree by Anne-Marie Selenko. The novel was filmed as Desiree in 1954, with Marlon Brando as Napoleon, Jean Simmons as Desiree, and Michael Rennie as Bernadotte. Bernadotte appears in a series of side missions in the video game Assassin's Creed Unity, again concerning the love triangle. The science fiction novel Starship Troopers by Robert A. Heinlein mentions and briefly discusses the election of General Bernadotte as the prospective King of Sweden. <laughs> Ancestry See also Guadalupe Fund Notes <laughs> <laughs>